The venue is unbelievable. The result, forgettable, as the Lions offense struggles to keep up on the Peach Bowl scoreboard. It's not like any other defense we've seen all year. Uh, it's just, you know, we, got, we have to play better. Things move a little too fast for the defense to handle. Once the Rebels fall in for six, the final result is just plain ugly. Ten wins with two new coordinators now on the job. We have some New Year's resolutions and possible solutions as the playoff field expands to 12 in 2024. It's time for Nittany Game Week. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Nittany Game Week. I'm Todd Sadowski alongside former Nittany Lions coaches Jay Paterno and Tom Bradley. Happy New Year, everyone. The calendar flips to 2024, and as the new year begins, we wrap up the 2023 season. So what's the process like as coaches put a bow on one year and transition to the next? You learn from the one year. I mean, you, you know, a couple weeks ago with Penn State 6-0, and they go 4-3 and three down the stretch, so there's some things to learn, a lot of good things to come out of this, thing, this season as well. So you got to make sure everybody's on the same page going forward before you get into the other stuff. Well, one of the other thing is, too, as a coach, the first thing, you don't look at the players. You look at yourself first. You look in the mirror, not out the window. Look at you and how yourself as a coach as the head guy, and then work your way down through the staff before you get to the players. And you start to have those discussions and exit interviews and things like that as you get to the end of the year. Well, what went right, what goes wrong on both offense and defense in the Peach Bowl? We take an expanded look at the new playoff system and how it affects rosters, plus a global view of our own program during the opening drive. <laughs> Well, let's start on the offensive side of the ball and first recognizing these indoor domes are impressive buildings. The 360 video screen at Mercedes-Benz Stadium in Atlanta, very cool. And a promising start as they rip off some big chunk plays through the middle with Nick Singleton. The theme remains inconsistency, though, against a higher-ranked opponent. Way too many incompletions. The end result is they can't keep pace on the scoreboard. Well, I think Ole Miss recognized early on that they were going to be able to handle Penn State's wideouts on the outside, forced this to become essentially a nine-on-nine -nine game, and uh, they were able to shut the run game down more, more as the game went on. Yeah, but I thought they, they left the run game too soon. I would have stayed with it a little bit longer. I thought that we could just be patient. One of the things that I thought Drew Aller did well was to move a little bit, be yep. mobile to create some space to throw the ball. You can see the end of that play right there, Penn State's biggest play as Tyler Warren gets that tip. And then here he is throwing the touchdown pass to Theo Johnson. So, Tom, that might be something we see more of next year, Drew Aller and that pocket moving. Yeah, I think you're going to see a lot of it next year more, a little bit more sprint out, rollouts, and different things of that nature to move that pocket for Drew. But I think the question is going to be, is it Drew Aller? I think that's the question for a lot of fans. Does it become Drew Aller or is this competition reopened? Uh, as they get in spring practice, but that remains to be seen. And if it's not Drew Aller all the time, right? right. It could be Bo Perbula even yeah. more so often. So yeah. we'll see. And Aller finishes 19 of 39 for the game. That's simply not good enough against top tier opponents. It's a little bit of Drew. I think it's a little bit of the offensive line. I think it's a little bit of the coaches. I think it's a little bit of the wide receivers. It's it's a piece of of all of it. Um, we got to make some plays for him, and and he's got to got to make some plays as well. We just you know didn't didn't play well enough offensively. Um, you know, it's 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 not like any other defense we've seen all year. Uh, it's just, you know, we, got, we have to play better. A solid red shirt freshman year for Prabula. He's a strong runner for sure. The question is whether his throwing accuracy is consistent enough to push Aller for the starting job. Defense, Tom, for Penn State, just regardless of who opted in and who opted out, this is going to be a tough matchup. Really the best in terms of personnel across the board that Penn State's seen all year. So even even with those guys, it's going to be a tough tough go for them, and Ole Miss certainly took advantage of that. Yeah, they sure did. They, they, they found the matchups they wanted and were able to exploit them. Way too many obstacles to overcome, especially against this team, and in particular, a coach like Lane Kiffin. You give him three and a half weeks offensively, he already does some great things, and there was really some creative ways that they went ahead and converted fourth downs using a defensive lineman, using a pass to 
Jackson Dart, all kinds of things that they threw at Penn State. Yeah, and I think the thing about it is they got in the tempo, which Penn State has not seen that much this year. They have guys that are you know, really good on the outside, as well as tight ends and running backs that can hurt you. So you got to cover every part of the field with an offense like that, and that became a problem for Penn State. But the problem is it's a bowl game. It's a lot of time to prepare. Those, those offensive guys, they go crazy with all that time to prepare. They make it hard on the defensive guys. But I thought the tempo is the one thing that really really was really tough on the Nittany Lion defense. Safety Kevin Winston explained what the goal is when you try to combat that quick tempo. It's getting to play and make sure everybody's on the same page because when they're doing hurry up, a lot of guys are just finished getting up from making a tackle or getting up from, you know, doing any, whatever they were doing on the play. And our main thing, you know, we always want to have our cleats set and be on the same page and sometimes hurry up, you know, cause, causes disruption with that. And that, that's our main, that's the main thing that causes difficulty with them. Well, the Nittany Lions surrender 540 total yards to Ole Miss, 19 first downs with their passing game. Two leading tacklers for Penn State are defensive backs Winston Jr. and Daquan Hardy. Well, for the first 19 episodes of our season, we save our pride picks for last to show all of our viewers the spirit of the blue and white. In our final show, we announce the winner of our pride pick playoff. Five finalists with only one winner to the prize a trip for two on the Happy Valley Cruise this March. And our winner is Kim Patterson from Harrisburg, PA for her submission Maryland road trip. It comes out of the group photo bracket and has strong support through the last few weeks of voting. The family does quite a job to hold off the competition. Over 120,000 total votes in our two rounds, six times as many as last year's contest. Should have guessed it, another win at Maryland. It's the Nittany Lions second home. We like to show you the winning moments, so here we are breaking the good news to Kim and her husband, Greg. Kim and Greg, it may have been a guy's trip to Maryland, but uh, Kim, you guys are the winners. So you submitted the picture, oh, so you fantastic. make the call. So Greg, you better be nice to her. There were 92,000 votes cast. You guys finished wow. first with 38.5% of the vote. Uh, that was just 98,000 votes cast in the final round. Um, wow. So just a just an incredible turnout, uh, but you guys came out first, so we're excited. Wow, that'll be fantastic! Thank you. That is amazing. Thank you so much. We're really looking forward to it. I love the reaction. A trip for two on the Happy Valley Cruise, March third through the tenth. For more information on how you can join them, check out happyvalleycruise.com. Congrats to Kim and Greg. Still to come, our final scouting report. In honor of the Big Ten's expansion as far west as La La Land, we have a Hollywood-themed special, which conference schools earn two enthusiastic thumbs up. From Coach Paterno and Coach Bradley coming up, you're watching Nittany Game Week. Opening Drive is sponsored by your local Ford store. Visit buyfordnow.com today. Welcome back. It is 2024, and you know what that means? The Big Ten goes Hollywood. Expansion all the way out to La La Land, Westford Ho, for the traditional Midwest schools. In honor of the now coast-to-coast -coast reach of the B1G, Coach Paterno and Coach Bradley have a special cinematic scouting report. That's right, Todd. The Big Ten is going Hollywood in 2024, <laughs> and we're going to get you ready for it. I'm not going to keep that voice up the whole time. So let's talk about the latest Big Ten films we just saw in the bowl games. Michigan versus Alabama, Tom. Two thumbs up for the offense and defense. Special teams, thumbs, thumbs down. down. Ohio State, thumbs up defense. Thumbs down offense, Penn State thumbs down both. We'll talk about that in a minute. Rutgers with a good win. Northwestern with a really good win. Maryland with a good win. Iowa, I don't even think their offense got off the bus. Wisconsin, great start, terrible finish. Minnesota, seventh straight bowl win, like almost like an indie film. They're really good. They keep winning these smaller bowls. But let's talk about Penn State. Let's review their film. Ole Miss, early in the game, Penn State got to them. Ole Miss, next, very next drive decides we're not going to let you get to our quarterback and get the ball out on rundowns when you run blitz. And you know that quick game is a, it's a problem for you, Tom. It's a real problem. They found the matchup. They won and went with it. Yep, only one sack in 42 pass attempts for the Penn State defense. Tough day for them. Now, once they got that going, they started to be more decisive. Again, decisive quarterbacks, Tom, get the ball out. Here you run the zone blitz, and now everybody talked about the corners, but here the safeties are out of position, and three guys covering grass, which I know never was something. No, you that's say. not a good thing. <laughs> a lot of grass to cover is not good. Yes, and right down the seam, 
uh, Jackson Dart gets the ball, catches it, knows exactly where he's going with it, and gets after it. Now, the next thing is, once you start to adjust the wideouts, and Penn State did a good job so on some of that, they say, okay, we're going to run the ball, and we're going to get our tight ends involved. Here, they fake the pitch, which brings the safety down. They bring number three, the tight end, out, and the safety misses that, and they get a big play out of it, Tom. Yeah, that to me is just a lack of communication on that one right there. I, uh, that's something that I'm sure that they had covered because if, to not be able to do that in this situation is not good. Now, on the defensive side of the ball, Penn State started out the ball game with running the ball pretty well. Got forced to Ole Miss started to say, okay, we're going to cover you up and try and play the run game. And now, a lot of criticism of Drew Allard, but to be fair to Drew, you know, here's the situation. He's under pressure right now. There's a guy in his face. And take a look at the five receivers club. Who's open? He had nobody to throw the ball to. Nobody to throw to it. I don't care how good you how good you are as a quarterback, or how much talent you got when no one's open, and you're forced to throw the ball before the guy gets out of his break. That's a tough way to handle it. Now, let's turn our attention to 2024 and the coming attractions in 2024 in the Big Ten. You've got four West Coast teams that went four and zero in bowl games: UCLA, USC, Washington, Oregon. That's going to be interesting. Penn State plays the first three of them, one of them being USC on the West Coast. Now, when you look at, okay, that's last year, but let's look into some new leading men, Tom. One you coached, uh, UCLA has a ensemble cast on defense. USC now brings Miller Moss with six touchdown passes against Louisville, and a guy you know, Tom, Danton Lynn is their new defense coordinator moved over from UCLA. Right, and Dan will do a great job. He's an outstanding young coach. Yep. He really is. Washington quarterback Will Rogers transferred from Mississippi State to replace Penix. And Oregon brings in two quarterbacks, Dylan Gabriel, who started for Oklahoma, and Dante Moore, UCLA's best quarterback recruited five-star. And let's take a look at them since we got a little bit of film on them. Here's UCLA's defense, top ten in the country last year. Dan Lynn did a great job. He moves over to USC, but they'll have that same talent, a lot of that same talent back when you see them. Then when you take a look at the next group we're going to talk about, here is Miller Moss, the quarterback we mentioned. Here's a 6'4 wideout he's throwing the ball to. They've got skilled guys coming back, Tom. You know USC. Yeah, they always, always got those have great skilled guys. And how do you cover that, Tom? You just don't. You don't. <laughs> and then let's talk about what else we got with with. Uh, with Washington bringing in Will Rogers, great name for a West for a movie. You know, Will Rogers never met never met a man he didn't like. He's coming in to take over Washington, who will come to Beaver Stadium next year. And then finally, you talk about uh, Oregon as if they needed a great quarterback. They go out and get uh, Dylan Gabriel from Oklahoma. Here he is throwing the game-winning touchdown pass against Texas. Now, Todd, we talk about. Big Ten, will the balance return? The first 10 years of Penn State in the Big Ten, eight of the 11 teams won titles. The last 10 years, only four of 14. Ohio State and Michigan have won the last seven and eight of the last 10. So we'll see if we get some change now with new teams coming in. I, would, I think you're going to see some changes because there's going to be a lot of things we talked about, a lot of the travel, a lot of different things going on here. So a lot of good new leading men and a guy who's always been a great leading man for us. Back over to you, Todd Sadowski. Appreciate that, guys. I'm usually stuck with just rotten tomatoes. It is all about the box office draw. We know the scouting report gets people in front of the screen. We thought it would be interesting to see which college games attract the most viewers from the 2023 regular season. Here are the numbers. The game, Michigan versus Ohio State. No surprise at the top with 19.07 million. Then it's Alabama versus Georgia in the SEC championship. And there's Penn State, Ohio State. Now, time for a short break. When we come back, our impact interview is about the process in which guys like Curtis Jacobs will be evaluated for the next level. A former college and NFL assistant, Jed Hughes, is now a global leader in consulting. And he'll go into detail about the NFL evaluation process next on Nittany Game Week. Impact Interview is sponsored by the Pocono Mountains, where small town charm meets big adventures. Book your trip today by visiting PoconoMountains.com. Well, welcome back to Nittany Game Week. Our interview today is with Jed Hughes, Vice Chairman of Global Sector Leader in Sport at Corn Ferry. But before becoming a global leader, listen to this coaching career. Made stops with Michigan, UCLA, Stanford, the Pittsburgh Steelers, and the Minnesota Vikings, all stops that involved coaching 
for Hall of Fame coaches. And I like this part here, Jed. While doing all that, you found time to get a master's degree from Stanford and a Ph.D. from Michigan. Thanks so much for joining us on the program. We're anxious to talk to you. My pleasure and Happy New Year to you and your guests. Yes, thank you, and Happy New Year to you as well. So, look, let's start with one of the more fascinating aspects of what you've done, and that's helping teams develop the assessments to evaluate players. And, of course, everybody's interested in the combine and the strength and the speed. But talk about the importance of the -the off-the-field interviews for the players and the evaluation process for the NFL teams. Well, I think, first of all, you know, the teams spend an inordinate amount of time on evaluating the player. It's the most efficient professional evaluation of athletes uh, in any sport. And uh, the mental part of it is probably the least uh, utilized because the interviews are short. They're 15 minutes, the horn buzzes, and you go to the next interview. And if you really want to interview somebody, you got to get them at a different time or you got to bring them into your organization. So uh, doing assessments, when we work with the Green Bay Packers, Ron Wolf is the GM, and we came up with three attributes someone that was uh, uh, had an exceptional work ethic that was passionate about football and could make a difference. And we would use an assessment tool to evaluate each player, uh, and then we compare those evaluations. And what we determined was someone that was really high on sociability and low on conscious restraint. Sociability meaning somebody that really liked to, liked to show themselves off, and conscious restraint, low side, meaning somebody who didn't think through the consequences of their behavior, that would raise a red flag. And you'd want to do, make sure you did your homework in terms of references, people you talk to uh, on the campus, uh, around about the athletes. And again, it varies. If you're a high round draft pick, uh, the incremental value versus aggravation factor is a little bit different than if you're a mid round, low round, or a free agent. So those things vary a little bit uh, based on on who the person is that you're evaluating, Todd. I've been involved in seeing the budget and numbers side of where college football is headed right now. So this seems to be a time of unprecedented change as it relates to the business model of college sports. What has surprised you the most, and where do you see this plane landing, so to speak? Well, first of all, I don't think the big plane is going to land in State College. The airport's too small. (laughs) We changed that, unfortunately. (laughs) All right. Well, you don't have to go to Harrisburg anymore. No, no. That's good. That's good. That's a good thing to hear. But what's happened, first of all, the media got involved. So if you look at what's happened with the SEC, uh, ESPN's gotten in control of that. And if you look at what's happened with the Big Ten, Fox on the West Coast got control of what owns the rights. I don't know many people know this, but the Big Ten does not own the rights to their network. They're owned by Fox. So uh, Kevin Warren being the commissioner, he was pushed into looking to ways to expand uh, revenue. And with the media deals uh, not set to expire until 35, he went back out and pushed the edge of the envelope and was able to get uh, deals done with CBS and NBC. So uh, you ask that question, so the amount of money that's coming to schools is unprecedented. Big Ten, what, $75 million, $80 million a year they're going to be getting starting next year. And their national exposure, uh, they're like professional football. They're on in the afternoon, noontime, 3.30, and at night. And then you've got coaches' salaries. And then you've got NIL. So you talk about the business model. That's happened because the NCAA has lost control. You know what I mean? There's nobody really running the ship. And what's going to end up happening, in my opinion, is going to be two mega conferences. Hey, Jed, as a Michigan grad who coached at both Stanford and UCLA, how strange is next season going to be seeing UCLA and Michigan both in the Big Ten and Stanford in the ACC? I think, first of all, let's look at the student athlete. That's the person that's going to be affected the most by the change in terms of how they're going to have to travel. Uh, Football is easy compared to the other sports on how they're going to be able to schedule them. So if they have to make a trip to the East Coast or West Coast, they're going to have time to be able to uh, refresh. I don't know how school is going to work. I think it's going to be really difficult. The fact that the the Pac-12 has broken up the way it has, I mean, it's just, it's unfortunate that TV revenue didn't happen the way it should. But disappointed, Tom, to be frank uh, to your question. Uh, It's hard hard to see. Uh, understand that we have to move forward and and 
you know, it's part of life. Change, as Chuck Noll used to say, the only thing <laughs> life in constant is change. A really interesting feedback from Jed Hughes about a lot of the process. We're going to step aside for the TV show to take a break. We will continue our interview. So if you want to see the conversation with Jed, make sure you go to NittanyGameWeek.com for the rest of the interview along with other web-exclusive content. Still to come, our scrap metal winner. It's an obvious choice and a repeat winner. Tyler Warren looking good in the Peach Bowl. We're heading into the final minutes of Nittany Game Week. Scrap Metal is sponsored by the We Are In, voted number one game day restaurant in Center County. Follow us on Facebook and visit thewearein.com or call for dinner or room reservations. A time for the final scrap metal winner of the season. This pick is obvious. He's really starting to shine in this offense. And the good news, Tom, is that he's coming back for another season. He's coming back, and he's the winner of probably one of the most prestigious awards in all of college football, second probably to the Heisman. But he did have five catches, 127 yards, and he's coming back. What a moment at halftime. Your mom gets a little emotional, Jay, as she represents Joe Pop for the second consecutive year at the Bobby Dodd Ceremony, the foundation based in Atlanta. They extend the invite. Very cool to see her there and receive a huge ovation from the Nittany Lions fans. She was emotional because she knew she had to come back to her family. Yeah, <laughs> couldn't stay in Atlanta <laughs> she, No, longer. couldn't stay away from us anymore, yeah. No, a really cool thing that they did, and it's uh, it's the second year they've done it, and it's, uh, it's just good to see people on the history of, of, of college football, all those guys. Our depth chart stays active online. We're connecting businesses that support the show with our viewers. Our goal is to build a team that keeps our hometown strong and give you a Penn State guide of places to visit when you travel, eat, and shop. The depth chart is only one of our features at NittanyGameWeek.com. You can revisit any episode of our first three seasons, watch our impact interviews, and check out all the pride picks. Make sure to check out NittanyGameWeek.com for our web exclusive content. And so it comes down to the final seconds of our season. What a fun time again. I appreciate you guys bringing your best every week. It's a pleasure to do the program with you each. A lot of energy, a lot of fun. We talk, we'll love to talk about the wins. Sometimes you just got to break down the losses, but you know, appreciate you guys making all the effort to be here. Oh, it's great. A lot of fun and looking forward to next year, 2024. Can't wait. Three seasons, 60 episodes already in the <laughs> books. For Jay and Tom, I'm Todd. We finished with a few pictures from the past season. Thanks so much for watching Nittany Game Week. Happy New Year, everyone.